Echo is a kid genius born in the streets of Zon. Despite his parents working hard to give him a future in the city of progress, Echo never wanted to leave his city. His parents wanted to give him a future far from the crime and pollution. But Echo saw more than just Zon's flaws. He saw the people and how their resourcefulness and resilience steered a hotbed of pure innovation. How they built a thriving culture from catastrophe and flourish where others would perish. He befriended orphans and runaways, kids like him. Even after finding a Hextech crystal and creating the Z-Drive, these didn't change. Now he has the power to go back in time and try over and over till things go his way. But with such a strong power comes great responsibility. Yes, he uses it to save his friends from trouble or to stop the camp barons of Zon, but he can also use it to manipulate people and get them to do what he wants without them ever knowing. Echo has seen a future where he abused this power, where he becomes a worse version of himself. There are also times where going back simply isn't enough, when no matter how many times he tries, he just can't save everyone. Echo has experienced loss, sadness and grief, not to mention the fear of disappointing his parents who just want him to have a better life. Yet Echo still pushes through, trying to do what he believes is right and elevate his city beyond what Piltover thinks of it. He's Zon's version of Spider-Man. A beacon of hope, a member of the community, a friend, Echo is truly one of my favorite characters from the world of Runeterra. But what if I told you that this character, this version of Echo, might no longer exist? As you may already know, Riot is making some important changes to the lore. But before getting into that, let's see how we got here in the first place. I think the Sentinels of Light event is a good place to start. In January of 2021, Riot released the Season 2021 cinematic, which was the first piece of a year-long campaign that would include multiple champion releases across different games, a brand new summer event for said games, as well as a Riot Forge release, which was unfortunately delayed. This was the biggest in-game lore event for the League of Legends IP since the Burning Tides back in 2015 and the battle for the Freljord in 2013. But the reception from fans wasn't quite what Riot was expecting. Focusing only on the narrative-related complaints, most lore fans were disappointed by the writing in the visual novel present in the event, where champions felt out of character and or irrelevant to the story, almost as if they were only present because they were chosen to have skins for the event. While characters very closely tied to Viego and or the Shadow Isles were barely present, if at all. There was also no information regarding what was happening with major characters during the event, and there was also this. Fresh's lore, his story, his themes, his narrative arc, his concept, his history, his personality, the world building, and everything that makes him unique in the game. On top of all of this, there were multiple versions of the same story across visual novels, cinematics, and comics, making fans understandably confused as to which one was the real story. The feedback of the event was so negative, both in terms of the metagame as well as its narrative, that Riot had to make a post talking about what went wrong and clarifying what did happen in the story. To this day, we still don't know the full events of the story beside these major story bits. Yes, there were a lot of factors happening in real life that contributed to this awful event, but if any company has the resources to adapt their plans or even delay them, is Riot Games. Also in 2021, Jarvan IV would be introduced to Legends of Runeterra alongside some cards that didn't quite fit the established timeline such as Citria, Lady of the Clouds, the more mature version of Citria being seen alongside the still alive Jarvan III. Fans were understandably confused, so rioters had to come out and say that first, not everything in the game is 100% canon, and second, the Citria incident was just a what-if scenario, despite confirming back in 2019 that everything in the game was canon. Unfortunately, this wouldn't be the first or last time this happened, some cards like Ravens or Kaisers do contradict the stories on universe, though not in any major way, but the card Rune Squire features an older version of the character Aerith alongside Tifalenji, who is currently dead in the lore. In 2021, we also saw the release of Arcane, a reimagining of the world of Runeterra in the form of a multiple episode series. This version of Runeterra contradicted most of the canon established for Piltover and Zon and their characters, so most lore fans just assumed it was an alternate timeline. We see this all the time in media, so it wasn't that far-fetched of an idea. Shortly after, we got the first Riot Forge games, and both were generally well received, with the Ruin King game providing some much needed context 
for the events of the Sentinels of Light story, such as the awakening of Diego. Riot Forge shared on Twitter a timeline of events related to the game, which is mostly fine except that Rune King states that the ruination happened 1022 years before the game, placing it in the year 27 BN, that's before Noxus, which contradicts the realms of Runeterra timeline, which states that the ruination happened in 25 BN. 2021 was also the year when multiple rioters who had worked on the narrative of Runeterra left the company, either by choice or because they were fired. In 2022, we got the Ruination book, which was well received, but we also saw the release of the final Caller story not tied to a champion release. After an awful lore event, confirmation that LOR isn't canon, lack of new Caller stories, a new series that doesn't take place in the main canon, and multiple writers leaving the company, fans were understandably worried, and things wouldn't get much better. There was no season cinematic in 2023, and even though those have always been ambiguous in terms of being canon or not, some were still tied to written stories, and they were always a refreshing look at some of her favorite champions in Runeterra. LOR would ignore prior storylines, as well as create new ones, but leave them without a resolution. The latter isn't the end of the world, League stories are very open-ended, but when a champion's story already ends on a cliffhanger and then LOR decides to tell a new story, it's a bit frustrating. Not to mention that with a lack of cinematics or written stories to complement the cards, as well as LOR's fewer resources, it's really hard for the game to tell a satisfying narrative on its own. The lack of resources also makes it hard for the team to release more champions or to give us more voice lines. Also, as a side note, someone should have told the marketing team for LOR that neither Mordekaiser nor his armor are in the Shadowlands. New League champions brought new controversies. Kaisanti brought with him a brand new small region of Shurima, Nezuma. And while introducing a new region and culture is really cool, it's always bittersweet when you know it won't be touched or expanded in the future unless the champion is very well received or released in LOR and sometimes not even that is enough. Nazuma being around for only 500 years, but being founded by the people who fled from the Darkin War, which happened a thousand years ago, was also a bit weird. Nafiri's bio had to be updated, since the original version implied that the Darkin Dagger was somehow shattered by mere hounds, not to mention how the bio is just a retelling of the events over cinematic. On top of this, in her Champion Insights, her DNA team confirms that her initial concept was that of a beginner-friendly assassin. They then decided it should be a creature, a dog in particular. They then had the idea of a whole pack instead of a single dog, and only after a couple of ideas from the artist did they finally land on her being a Darkin. And I assume the Fury being who Varus was searching for was probably only thought later into development, assuming it was thought at all by the original writers. Clearly, for a game like League of Legends, this process, which is called bottom-up, works decently well. But if you consider that this universe is now bigger than just League, I think narrative should also have a much bigger priority in the development of new champions. For example, the gameplay of Belveth in League and how she's described in her stories are different enough to be considered a small case of ludonarrative dissonance. In the lore, she's this being that can think and act as fast as a supercomputer, because she's the sum of the conscience of multiple people. Yet, in the game, she just slaps you really fast. It's clear that gameplay took a higher priority here, just like it did for most recent champions. And like Nefiri, Smuller's bio also had to be updated. The mention of dragons accompanying Viego to the Blessed Isles was removed, because, well, we have a whole book about that event and Smuller's bio was very much contradicting it. And just like in LOR, champion voiceovers in League were reduced in length, which, as Riot Praeco mentions, makes sense since League isn't really the type of game for long dialogues and multiple voice lines. However, outside of stories, for a long time this was the only place where you could really get a taste of the champion's personality, even if it didn't always match their story. Breer, for example, only interacts with three champions, and none of them are even mentioned in her biography and only two of them are even remotely related to her for now. I know she's a jungler, but a single line towards Swain wouldn't hurt. Obviously, her relationship with Talon could be explored in the future, but still, compared to the voiceovers released before and after, as well as champions in LOR, she ended up feeling like an outlier because of her in-game role. For League, Riot also used lore as one of the excuses for removing Summoner's name, in favor of Riot IDs, which is really dishonest considering that the main map of the game is still called Called Summoner's Rift, something they are very well aware of. Riot Forge brought us three new games in 2023. Mage Seeker starts with a retcon of the 
ending of the Lux comic. In the comic, Lux sees Silas fleeing through the sewers with other mages, while in the Mage Seeker, Silas flees with the help of his former mentor. But to be fair, Silas' story already had a couple of minor conflicting details before the game. Despite conversions, presentation and gameplay being really solid, the story was underwhelming, and the inclusion and portrait of some champions was really disappointing. Warwick is treated as a mindless beast, both him and Jinx add nothing to the story and the Steel Shadow, the Grey Lady, the cold-blooded assassin Camille feels surprisingly friendly and cooperative for some reason. One of the achievements in Song of Nunu says that Ramshara was abandoned 3000 years ago, yet we know from the realms of Runeterra timeline that the war with the Watchers happened around 8000 years before Noxus, which means around 9 years before the present year. And we know that Willump left Ramshara after Lysander's betrayal. Besides the achievement, there's also a stronghold said to have been abandoned 3000 years ago. Since it was built by the Three Sisters, the implication might also be that the war happened 3000 years ago. Again, this conflicts with the current timeline. We know some Forge games were being developed at the same time as cards for LOR, and we got confirmation that a lot of what we see from Bendel City cards came from Bendel Tale. Yet, there's little narrative connecting the stories from LOR and from the Forge games and some, like Morganas, might even contradict each other. And finally, the worst thing to happen in 2023, if the lack of color stories not tied to a new champion wasn't bad enough, new league champions getting color stories also stopped being the norm. Instead, we saw champions releasing alongside other types of experiences when possible. Color stories and these new experiences are now mutually exclusive, unlike in the past. And some champions, like Smolder, might not even get either. Unless Riot counts a 1 minute teaser as a lore experience, which on Honestly, they probably do. This isn't to say that we didn't get great things. The Will of the Dead story, the Katarina comic, Nidalee's visual healwork and even Song of Nunu are good examples of new pieces of lore that are really good, even if they are all scattered across the internet or in Riot's various games. Like seriously, why was the Will of the Dead not released on Universe? Or any of the Riot Forge comics? But during all of this, Riot was working on something else behind the scenes. Let me finally explain why Echo, one of my favorite characters from Runeterra, might no longer exist. In February of 2023, in a Dev Diary video, Riot Brightmoon and Riot Meddler mentioned that storytelling in different places can be inconsistent at times. In terms of how different parts of the story or characters of the world are portrayed in different places, and because of this, Riot was going to be a lot more thoughtful and a lot more deliberate about how they make a consistent and cohesive wider Runeterra experience. Following this, Medler also added on Reddit how they were figuring out how to have all the different teams across different games and non-game stuff like Arcane work on the lore in a coordinate, cohesive manner, and that they wanted to get to a state where Arcane, League, LOR, etc. are all clearly building in the same canon. Eight months of silence later, in October of 2023, we got another update reiterating on the same ideas. Riot Poison Pixie, head of IP Creative, mentioned again how Riot has introduced some inconsistencies to the lore of Runeterra over the years, mentioning specifically the origin of Xtech and Yorick's absence in the narrative of the Sentinels of Light event. Then, she said that from that day forward, all future storytelling would be part of one shared canon, and that their current goal is to ensure that major events and stories, as well as the essence of what makes a champion who they are, is reflected across everything Riot makes. However, she also mentioned how getting to that state will be a gradual process. She confirmed that they aren't retconning every story, but that every time they touch a part of the League universe, they are going to analyze the inconsistencies and make the necessary changes so that everything makes sense. Let's put a pin on that. Riot Brightmoon and Riot Meddler confirmed once again Riot's goal of one single consistent canon. Brightmoon mentioned how some past cinematics are consistent with the canon, but some aren't, and that he'll make sure all future cinematics will be canon starting with Still Here. He also confirmed that Song of Nunu is canon. Meddler confirmed that he'll make the updates necessary so that champions such as Seraphine and Camille fit well with the new origin of X-Tech shown in Arcane. Meddler also mentioned how color stories are a very niche experience, as most players never engage with them, so they are focusing instead on storytelling through other mediums, that also let them flesh out characters in the world while resonating with more of the wider player base. They also answered a couple questions on social media, both writers confirmed once again that Arcane is canon, Meddler also confirmed that the universe website isn't going anywhere at the moment, 
but that they are focusing on making everything consistent and how it should be presented in the games slash other experiences before focusing on universe. Poison Pixie also said that they are working on how to clarify what is canon versus what is inspirational. I'm not sure what inspirational means, but the comic tied to Song of Nunu explicitly said that it was inspired by the story where Nunu and Willem met, meaning it's not an exactly one-to-one -one version of the story. Riot Latency also confirmed that x -Tech Mayhem is mostly just a fun video game, despite the characters behaving well in character. He also said something similar about Bandeltail, with Poison Pixie later adding that the partner developers had some creative freedom when developing their games. This could be what they mean by inspirational, therefore stuff like Riven's cards in LOR could also fall under this umbrella, as well as other lore experiences that only differ slightly from established canon like the start of the Mage Seeker game. More stuff has happened since this update to the lore and I'll get into that, but before I think we can sum it up into two parts. The first one is a shift from written stories to other forms of storytelling, forms that are more appealing to a larger audience, which so far we've seen in arcane games, in client experiences and cinematics. The second is the focus on one singular cohesive universe, meaning no more alternate versions of the same story. This mainly affects the events of Sentinels of Light, since there's still not a single definite version of the story, as well as the pieces of lore that contradict Arcane. To achieve the second, writers mention fixing all the inconsistencies across the lore, but they only mention the ones caused by stories being different across multiple experiences, like Sentinels and Arcane, and not other inconsistencies like when Legends of Runeterra contradicts stories or when stories and games contradict pre-established timelines. In my opinion, all the issues with the lore stem from poor management and lack of cohesion. Who would have thought that treating an important part of the development of your product as disposable would lead to negative feedback from the people who consume and engage with said product, and lead to further resources having to be spent on fixing the mistakes that were made? But, believe it or not, we've been in a similar, yet actually even more drastic situation before. Almost a decade ago, in September of 2014, Riot released a dev blog title exploring Runeterra. In this post they explain how limiting the concept of summoners and champions joining the League of Legends was in terms of storytelling. Yes, the concept of summoners that control champions used to be canon, as well as the map Summoner's Rift and even the League of Legends itself. But the very idea of summoners being so powerful made champions feel more like puppets. The team decided to stop focusing on explaining in-game actions, essentially making the game itself not canon anymore. The League of Legends no longer existed in the lore, and neither did the Summoner's Rift nor the Summoners. The Journal of Justice, one of the main sources of lore at the time, was now non-canon. We kind of felt like we needed a premise for the world that explained who the characters were and why they were there. And I think in retrospect, like that was constraining and it was kind of a mistake. And um, you know, the problem was like, we were trying to sort of wrap up all of these disparate game mechanics that were part of a bunch of systems that made a game fun with a story veneer. And it's sort of over explaining, like we often compare that to like midichlorians in, in Star Wars, where it's like, we, you know, we don't necessarily ever need to know like how the force works scientifically, biologically, etc. Like, it's okay that it's like magic in space, like that's awesome. In the same dev blog, Riot also mentioned how champions should always feel the same, regardless of whether it's a story, a cinematic, or in League of Legends, which is funny in hindsight. The process of updating everything happened over time, as a lot of champions' origins and voice lines no longer fit this new Runeterra, so what was and wasn't canon wasn't very clear. In the following years, Riot would release new champions, stories, comics, the Burning Tides event, and even the Universe website. Released in beta in November of 2016, the Universe was a place where players could find everything related to the lore, a place where everything was canon. If you had one wish that you could tell Riot, and they would do it, one thing you would tell them, and they would do it. Well, yesterday Riot did it for me, because this website is every single piece of lore that was ever made canon on one website. At this point, not everything was updated yet. That would still take a while, but what Riot did might sound familiar. Every time they touched a new part of the lore, they updated it. Whenever a new champion or champion rework was released, they updated other champions or their entire region. 
because we're doing the rework with Galio and everything, which we're really excited about, this just seemed like a really good time to dive into Demacia, what it's all about, a little, talk a little bit about its history, um, its, its military, how it came to be and stuff like that. We saw these updates with the release of Camille and the region of Piltover at the end of 2016 and shortly after with Warwick and Zorn at the start of 2017. Also in 2017 we got Galio and Damasia, Rakan and Zaya and Avastaya and Zoe and Targan. In 2018, Swain and Noxus, Kaiser and the Void, Irelia and Ionia, Pike and Bilgewater, Aatrox and the Darkin, and later we even got a new interactive map of Runeterra. In order to make Runeterra as believable as possible, we focused a lot about the physical geography of the world, where mountains were, where rivers were, how people might settle that land. With that kind of information, then we can talk about what kind of food people eat, what the climate's like, how they get along with each other, where they might move in terms of migration to seek those things out, and that lets us understand where the borders between all of our factions are. And obviously, there were other champions, reworks, stories, comics, etc. throughout the years, each contributing to this new Runeterra. 2018 was all about setting the baseline for the world of Runeterra. We couldn't even really explain where the different locations existed until we could share with you a map of the world. But starting this year, we're going to talk a lot more about what these locations are like, and more importantly, how the champions connect to them and to each other. These updates weren't always great or well received, and some of the bios and stories have been tweaked or changed even after the retcon, either because of backlash, like Karma's biography, or because of new stories being introduced that retcon previous ones, like having to remove Lux's staff from her story after her comic was released, or the origin of the Darkin, which was changed twice. But it was thanks to bios and stories that we got what we currently know as Runeterra and all its regions. Not every single champion managed to be updated, or even be part of this new world. Some still lack a proper biography to this day. Uh, right, okay, so Corky, Shaco, Cho'Gath, Kog'Maw, Rumble, Twitch, Heimerdinger, Talon, and Teemo still don't have full character biographies, and the biographies they do have contain information which is straight up wrong, okay? Zillion still doesn't have a single short story to his name and neither does Nivea, Alistar, or T- Okay, yeah, okay, so clearly, clearly, they, they, ha they haven't quite finished tidying things up yet. But overall, this was a change that I would say was mostly beneficial for the narrative of Runeterra. And it was around this time, circa 2019, that things really started to go downhill, with new controversies like champions coming back from the dead, Seraphine's questionable lore on release, the downfall of monster champions, new regions emerging just to be left in the dust, so many shirtless men and pretty women, the lack of updates to the map, and do you remember Telstones? And the secret message from Rise? Well, that was supposed to be the first of many, with the rest being released alongside other versions of Telstones, which never happen. <laughs> Considering all of these things, well, it's not hard to see how the Sentinels of Light event failed so miserably. But now, Riot wants to update things again, not on the scale of the last retcon, but they still have quite a task ahead of them. Like last time, they want this to be a gradual process. They say they will update the world piece by piece as new experiences are released. But when exactly are they going to do this? In the past, these updates mostly came bundled alongside new champion releases or reworks. But we know that the league team has shifted its focus from champions and reworks to game modes and ASUs. The former aren't gone, we're still getting a lot, but we can't expect as many as we used to. In 2024, we can expect a total of 3 champions and 1 VGU, and certainly not all new champions or VGUs will bring major changes to the lore like Skarners. Smolder being a good example, with his introduction nothing was retconned, only new stuff was added like the history of the Camavoran dragons, and I suspect this is what we'll see for the foreseeable future. Champions that are mostly disconnected from the rest of the lore and bring with them small new pieces of lore that can safely fit into this new cohesive canon. As for ASUs, yeah, I doubt Tim will finally get a bio. Neither Ari, Caitlyn or Jax got any new lore with their updates, so I don't expect Timu and Lee Sin to get new lore either. So when exactly are they updating things? When a new game is released? Perhaps when new cards are released for Legends of Runeterra? Or when Arcane gets its new season? It's possible, they also said that they are looking for new ways for players to experience the lore outside of stories, so maybe these new experiences will come alongside an update, though we can't really say for sure. 
ok, so we can't answer when, but what about how? How exactly are they going to update things? No, really, how? In the past, they have done it through biography updates, tweaks to older stories and brand new stories. Yes, we had teasers, cinematics, Q&As, champion insights and other dev blogs, but the real meat of the lore was always found on the universe website. But not only is the website not a priority, but neither are written stories. So where are we going to see these updates? They could go back and tweak stories and bios, but that sorta of goes against what they said, doesn't it? Why would they waste resources on updating those niche experiences if most players don't even engage with them? It's not impossible, they did it for Nefury and Smolder recently, and obviously Skyner's VGU required a brand new lore, obviously, but will they do it again? On a bigger scale? And what about other pieces of lore? They could update cards in Legends of Runeterra, but would it really be worth for them to do so? What about Forge games? Those indie developers moved on to other projects, surely updating them is out of the question, no? Not to mention the physical books and comics or past cinematics. How exactly are they going to do this without using the universe or without creating another interactive website or experience that will end up only attracting a small audience. Surely they aren't going to slap a non-canon disclaimer on everything, right? Let's say, for example, that in 2024, Warwick makes his debut in Arcane, and his depiction in the show isn't one-to-one -to, -one to what we currently have. Maybe in the same year, he's also released in Legends of Runeterra, now fully based on his Arcane version. The Warwick as we know now will just be non-canon, and the only lore that we'll have of him is going to be in Arcane and maybe in a couple of cards. But what about his biography and stories? Will those remain unchanged? Rotting on the universe website? If there are elements on them that don't contradict Arcane, should we consider them canon or not? Sure, Nafiri's trailer is awesome, but if you don't know much about the lore, watching it won't make you understand her, the Darkin, or the world more than by reading a story. The same thing applies to Breer's cinematic and her teaser in The Client, the one that you can no longer experience besides watching videos online, which also applies to any in-client experience by the way. And I'm mentioning this experience in specific because Riot Lexicon confirmed that they were in some way intended to replace color stories. In my opinion, you could combine all of these experiences and cinematics and they wouldn't even come close to the heavy lifting stories and bios do for the world of Runeterra. The only thing that comes close are the artworks and descriptions of Legends of Runeterra cards, but even those can only go so far. The cards are good to explore how the world looks, species, people, jobs, food, things that might not need to be fully explored in a written story, but still contribute to the world building of Runeterra. But when it comes to telling a satisfying narrative, a slideshow can only do so much. Similarly, the music cinematics are too short to tell the stories they want to tell, and unless you already know the world and the characters, you're missing on a lot of context, which doesn't happen with written stories and biographies since almost every single one present on universe can be read without any prior context. Sure, knowing more about the world might help you understand certain parts better, but the core of the story is fully accessible to anyone, without prior knowledge. If you need an interview, or skin bio, or even to read a couple stories to explain what the hell is happening in a cinematic, then the cinematic might not be the best vehicle for the story you're trying to tell, despite how much effort, passion and attention to detail it went into making it. I'm not saying cinematics shouldn't be made, or that they don't have their place. I'm saying that these cinematics, with songs and many champions in different locations, have a hard time telling a satisfying story on their own. They work best as a part of something bigger, like Varus' cinematic, As We Fall, which bridges the gap between two parts of his comic. And I know Riot is aware of all of this, it's one of the things that they are trying to solve. They've mentioned that they are looking for new ways, not only for players to experience the lore, but also to progress said lore in a meaningful way that these short experiences just can't do. But right now, I just don't see how Riot can achieve this outside of a series or non-life service games. And so story in and around League needs to be presented um, in creative ways. We thought it'd be really interesting to try and tell a longer story. Could we start a story in one medium and go into another one and then go into a third one maybe and actually get players to care enough to click through each time to see what happens in the next chapter. 
if Camille never shows up in Arcane, how will we know what changed about her? If Skarner's lore is updated but not Camille's, how will we know what changed? Will they just make a dev post and call it a day, leaving Camille's story and bio unchanged? Right now and for the foreseeable future, what's canon and what isn't is going to be ambiguous, especially for these champions from Piltover and Zorn unless Riot invests in updating their stories. Currently, the only lore pieces we know for sure are canon are Arcane, Song of Nunu and the Still Here cinematic. And since Riot confirmed that everything after that dev diary was canon, then Huey's Bayou, Huey's Story, Smolder's Bayou and, yeah, yeah. and LOR's expansion Fate's Voyage Beyond should also be canon. And since the narrative of this expansion is a continuation of the previous one, Fate's Voyage Onward, then that one might be canon too and this makes sense if you consider the design of Zon in the cards and how it changed during development. On a similar note, the Wild Rift cinematic promoting Syndra's release could also be canon as it doesn't contradict anything previously established besides the omission of the characters from her story. Still, if even after they said that everything from now on is canon, we are still debating whether or not it is canon, then that's not a good sign. Battletail comes to mind. You might think I'm exaggerating, after all it's mostly Piltover and Zon that's being affected and even if we ignore that PNZ Combine have the largest pool of champions, you're still right. This isn't a huge retcon, or is it? You see, like TB Skyn explained in his video, the Runeterra scene in Arcane feels like a very different world than the Runeterra we know from the stories, mostly because both depict magic quite differently. I highly recommend you watch this video, but in short, Runeterra is all about magic. From the animals, the plants, the people, the land, every single living being and object interacts with magic in some way. It is literally everywhere. In Arcane, magic is treated almost as something of legend, scarce, rare, at least in Piltover. Every single aspect of the world of Arcane is inspired by the Runeterra we know, but it's not the same. In fact, it is because it's not the same that they were able to tell the story they wanted. These aren't the same characters. These Heimerdingers couldn't be more opposites. These Jaces are completely different people. These cities are not the same. This world can't be the same. Sure, in Season 2, the cities and the characters might become closer to the versions we've known for years, but they can't possibly ever be one in the same. And how would Yordles, one of the most magical species on Runeterra, see magic as something that is dangerous and nothing else? Like, have you seen where they come from? It feels like years of work done by many writers and years of investment from fans are being thrown under the bus in favor of retcons and experiences that are appealing to the general audience, drive more engagement and are therefore more profitable. And that onto itself isn't that bad. More people engaging with the lore and the lore being more profitable means Riot can invest more in it. The problem is that Riot's higher-ups never really cared for the lore or its fans, and they surely never cared for the people working on it who had to convince them and beg them time and time again to let them make cool stuff for us. And now it's up to those same people to figure out a way to solve this mess and we're yet to see their plan to achieve this cohesive singular canon. Arcane could have easily existed as a separate universe, but Riot didn't want to invest into that. It makes more sense to just say that the most profitable piece of lore is canon and just roll with it. We all know that adaptations are never one-to-one -one translations of their source material. Every single movie adaptation of a book tells a slightly different story. Marvel has separate universes, and even FNAF books differ from the game. But when one of these becomes way more popular and way more profitable, then changes start to happen. It's quite common with Marvel. Around the time a new movie comes out, characters in the comics begin changing to look and act more like their live action counterparts. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Again, I want more people to know about the world of Runeterra. I want more people to be invested and love this world like I do. And Arcane was the entry point for a lot of people. And to some, the world of Runeterra isn't much more than the show itself. So I totally understand that making it canon just makes sense as a business decision. And if you want Arcane to be canon, that's completely valid, regardless if you followed the lore before watching the show or not. The show is amazing. And if you want Arcane to not be canon, that's also valid. We had a lot of great stories that might be going away because of it. As someone who has been following the lore for years, I would be very happy with Arcane just existing as an alternate depiction of Runeterra. Again, just like Marvel. Though, let's be honest, if the higher-ups never gave the funds and resources that the writers, editors and artists needed to keep one version of this universe cohesive and consistent, there's no way that there was ever going to be two versions. 
and that's probably the second reason why they want Arcane to be canon. But if making Arcane canon was what Riot intended back in 2021, there should have been a deliberate effort to make that happen. Not let it drag out for two years, just to say that now it is canon, but that you are still figuring out how you'll make the rest of the world cohesive with it. Again, the blame here is on the higher-ups and the people who managed all of this. This could have been avoided if they had the foresight and wanted to make Arcane canon from the get-go. Because honestly, making Arcane canon was probably not even their intention in the first place. For example, the rioters working on the Caitlyn ASU didn't even know her role in Arcane, despite the goal of the ASU being to update her so that the players who watch the show wouldn't be surprised by how outdated she looked in-game. There's also conversions, which, besides all the inconsistencies it might have with Arcane, the game literally depicts the show as a separate universe. This means that, despite all the reference to stories and LOR cards it has, the game will likely not be canon. And if you really think about it, Arcane was pitched around the time Echo was released in League of Legends, meaning every single piece of lore we got for him was made while Arcane was being worked on in the background. So the game, and even this whole version of Echo not being canon, is just crazy to me. But let's try to be positive. If we ignore how different these two worlds feel, most stories will probably remain unaffected by this update, right? But can we, the fans, say for certain which ones? You might say, okay, maybe everything that was released in the last year or so, except that includes conversions. And you might add, okay, but that game takes place in zone, everything else should be fine. And yes, you are right, but how can we know for certain? Piltover and Zorn have ties to various other regions after all, and Arcane is apparently introducing more conflicts surrounding the world runes, which means there could be major implications for the wider timeline of Runeterra, since Heimerdinger experienced these conflicts despite being only 307 years old. And since this update also includes Riot moving away from written stories, what's stopping them from moving away from bios as well? At the end of the day, those were found in the same place as the stories and they are just as niche. And the last ones that we got weren't even that rich in terms of content anyway. Not to mention how LORs and TFT's exclusive champions aren't even on the website. They don't even have bios despite being canon. I can totally see a future where league champions get the same treatment. The same thing goes for champion insights, roadmaps and other devlogs. Is there really an audience big enough for these kinds of posts? The lack of foresight and the disregard for the narrative of Runeterra from Riot executives and higher-ups have left us with an incohesive mess of cannons and without a good way to update the lore and show the changes and retcons to the passionate fans of this world. I wrote the majority of this script in the days following the update from last year, and I felt like I was salty or nitpicky, and I didn't want to end the video on such a negative note. In fact, I wanted to end on a hopeful one, especially after the last league update. I even commissioned this thumbnail with that in mind. However, something else happened. On the 22nd of January, everyone was surprised with a message from Dylan Hadera, Chief Executive Officer at Riot Games, and Mark Merrill, Chief Product Officer at Riot Games. This message came in the form of a post for players on the Riot Games website and an email for rioters which was made available to the public also in the form of a post. In it, Dylan and Mark let us know that Riot Games was laying off over 500 people. They tell us that since 2019, they have invested in many projects, some of which didn't pay off the way they expected. They want to refocus and work toward a more sustainable future. By refocusing, they mean investing in projects that, and I quote, drive the most player value, the things that are truly worth the player's time. These are League PC, Valorant, TFT, Wild Rift, their R&D projects, esports and entertainment. Which is a vague term, since everything I just mentioned is technically entertainment, but they seem to be referring to things like Arcane and KDA, so entertainment outside of video games. The biggest impact of these layoffs would be on teams outside of their core development outside of these projects. Legends of Runeterra's team was reduced in size and will shift its focus to PvE as that's what most of its player base engages with. 
and Riot Forge saw its last game being released this year. Personally, this got me really depressed. It felt like we were back in 2021 all over again. Keep in mind that they might have fired over 500 people this year, but they also didn't renovate the contracts of a lot of folks last year. The number of people who lost their jobs is much bigger than this. And the reason they gave us wasn't really a good one. Sure, they invested in these projects and they weren't as profitable as they expected, so if they are cancelling or scrapping the projects, they have to fire the people who are working on them. Except why couldn't these people just move on to other projects at Riot? It's not like they don't have an R&D division, it's not like they aren't working on an MMO, on a fighting game and probably on another game as well, not to mention that they also have a live service MOBA and an FPS, one of which has a mobile version and another with a mobile version being worked on behind the scenes. And that's ignoring the fact that a lot of people working on these games that weren't scrapped, that the higher ups mention as their priority at the moment, were also fired. Sure, some of the people who were fired managed to be hired again. But damn, I can't imagine how demoralizing that was, regardless if they did or not, to be treated as disposable like that. Why would they fire people who worked on the last cinematic, who worked on recent League Champions, who were actively working on projects that were going to be released either this year or the next one? Hell, Riot is working on an MMO, yet they keep letting go of so many of their narrative stuff. Speaking of which, let's see how this might impact the lore. Well first, no more Forge games means we are losing what was essentially the biggest if not only source of new stories and or larger narratives, not counting Arcane. As for LOR, its lack of resources was already making it hard to deliver in terms of actual stories, but with the next set being essentially the last as we know them, then they might go back to releasing champions whose artworks and flavors are much more self-contained and well at a slower rate of course. Not everything is bad, for example LOR is now part of League Studio, which is the entity within Riot Games that makes League of Legends, Wild Rift and Team Fight Tactics along with other games in development, meaning LOR's team is going to work closer with the other teams who work on Runeterra games, which obviously leads to more cohesion. But overall, as it stands, this is a major loss for the fans of the Lord of Runeterra and honestly a major loss in the trust players have in Riot Games in general, which has only been going downhill in recent years. Terrible news aside, 2023 also brought us small updates to the lore. The last devlog for League announced that Skarner's rework is being released in March, which hopefully will come with a new biography and story, since Dream Song will no longer be canon, and we're also getting both Ambessa and an Arcane inspired VGU in League, so they are clearly committing to making Arcane canon. I look forward to see how Ambessa fits into or changes the broader picture we have of Noxus. We also got a new season cinematic which had a lot of lore details, but at the end of the day it's just a music video, it's too short to tell 3 satisfying stories without context, and to know that our first lore skin of 2023 is actually a paid cosmetic, showing a what if scenario for a popular champion just to promote a new ranked season was really disappointing. Wild Rift got two dev updates, the first one sees Medler basically reiterating what he said on the dev update for League, how the lore has lacked cohesion and how they are actively working toward one shared canon. He also mentioned how they, and I quote, want to make sure Wild Rift is a great place for you to dive into to enrich your experience with the League of Legends universe. He also adds, we'll be looking to revisit some existing League stories and even expand on them where it makes sense to do so. He also confirmed that Ambessa is also coming to Wild Rift. On another dev update for the game, David Yu, Wild Rift's product lead, mentions how each patch will now have a team, and the next one will be teamed after the Shadow Isles. He mentions how with the patch, players will be able to learn about the history of the Shadow Isles and how it came to be. I'm not sure how Wild Rift is going to make this happen, the game never shied away from lore, from small cinematics to lore quizzes, but telling or retelling stories, I'm not quite sure how they will pull it off. They already have the systems in place for visual novels and even small interactions like the ones it had for its guild versus guild mode, so there's potential there, but I'm skeptical as they have yet to use these systems to something that is canon, or at least not inspirational. Hello, Twisted from the Future here, while editing this video, the Wild Rift team released a video going through all the new stuff in the upcoming patch. They mentioned how they have worked to merge the lore of Runeterra into the game and that 
that soon, players will be able to learn about the history of the Shadow Elves. This will happen in three acts, starting with Kalista's release, then Viego and then Maokai. During the event, players will be able to experience what seems to be a retelling of the events of the novel in various visual formats. This will then be stored in the player's collection so they can experience them again at any time, which is really good considering so far this type of experiences are usually removed from the game. There was also mention of new lore, which I assume will come with Maokai. They are also introducing a wave defense PvE game mode Yes, PvE game mode based on the story and even the Summoner's Rift itself and items are receiving a Shadow Wells themed update. I just hope the story remains faithful to the novel, they did mess it up a little bit with Smolder's release, but for now I'm saving my judgement as we've yet to see how they retell an already existing story and we've also yet to see how they tell a new one. So far this is pretty exciting, I myself will be playing Wild Rift again just because of it. And now back to my old self. LOR also seems to still want to engage with the lore in a significant way. Dave Gusking said that in the past they used cards to do world building for Runeterra but that they are shifting toward using Path of Champions and Adventures to do that instead. Eric Shen also confirmed that there will be more story-based content in Path of Champions. The first thing that came to mind when I read this were the Arcane Adventures, which are no longer available, as well as the Champion Campaign Adventures. Again, like with Wild Rift, neither of these are actually canon. The Arcane Adventures are based on both the Arcane versions of the characters and or their soon-to-be-outdated League counterparts and in the Champion Campaigns, well, the Champions do behave in character, but there are very few stories that actually make sense. If these adventures aren't canon, why should we as lore fans even bother? Like sure, a what if scenario where Annie goes to Ionia is cool and all, but it's just a what if scenario. The champions might behave in character, but why should I invest into these adventures as someone who cares about the lore? I'm skeptical on how well this is going to be implemented, especially with LOR's fewer resources. But hey, maybe being part of League Studio will be handy in this department. As for the other Runeterra games, well, League is probably going to remain the same, with lore only coming in the form of new champions and the occasional cinematics. I don't expect 2XKO to lean too heavily on the lore, however, a fighting game not having a story mode is really bad when it comes to casual audiences, so perhaps we'll see some story in the game. If that story will be canon or not, I have no idea. As for the MMO, I'm really not too hopeful, especially after so many writers and editors left as well as Greg Street, who to me always seemed like someone who genuinely cared about the world of Runeterra. But it's honestly way too soon to even think about the MMO, and the same probably goes for Project F and any other project Riot might be working on behind the scenes. Twisted from the future again, we are finally starting to learn about the new Skarner and, well, he is a completely new character. The only thing they decided to keep was was the fact that he's a scorpion. His backstory, personality and even moral alignment are completely different. And then Lexi added this statement on Reddit, which one proves that the people working on Skarner didn't understand his character. For them, he was just a victim, which apparently is a bad thing because it takes agency out of the character, something they also mentioned in Briar's insights and I truly don't understand it. And he apparently had no goals. Like really? No goals? Not even to protect or preserve his people? Maybe tell the Piltovans that hey, this is my kind and we are alive and sentient? No? Alright. Secondly, she confirms that while working on Skarner, they were already trying to figure out how to make Arcane canon and that it was safer and faster to just cut Skarner out of the picture. Arcane doesn't really contradict Skarner's lore, in fact it contradicts Camille's way more and they say they kept what was compelling about him. But did they? Don't get me wrong, the new Skarner is good. The team who worked on his rework were told to get rid of the crystals and x tech connection and they did. But they also got rid of him being a victim of mankind's exploitation, which was a very interesting part of his character, explored in a way that's very unique in media and that could have been explored further even without the x tech or soul crystals. Replacing one good thing with another is just going to alienate the people who like the first one and the second one is undoubtedly going to suffer because of it. Though obviously Skarner isn't popular, so Riot was never afraid of that. Arcane being canon might not be a big deal if you look at the bigger picture, but personally I don't care much for the bigger picture, I mean I do to some extent, otherwise this video wouldn't be so long, but I 
care much more for the characters and their stories, and well, Arkane just removed one of them, and I fear this might be the first of many. Though, as I said, Riot never understood Skarner, and the Seraphine situation just makes more sense now than ever. This is what happens when a champion gets barely any lore, and the people who worked on that lore are fired. So now that you're caught up to speed on everything that's been happening to the lore of League of Legends in the past few years, let's actually think about what Riot can do to fix it. Most of the minor inconsistencies are easy to fix. It's a matter of changing a number, a line in a story, or removing a character from an artwork or a voice line. Eraphs being the exception, as honestly, I can't see this card being anything else but a what-if scenario, unless they bring Tifalenshi back from the dead, which in this world isn't super far-fetched. As for Echo, everything we have for him so far could be explained as being from a different timeline. This includes his biography, cinematic, cards, stories, comics, and the conversions game. This would make me really sad, but oh well. As for the more important issue of how will Riot handle the retcons, this one is harder to solve. This isn't confirmed, but from what they've said so far, the universe website and stories might not be the way to go. They're too niche, and not many players engage with them. But besides updating the stories and bios on universe, I have no idea what they'll do or what they can even do. Hopefully it won't just be a devlog post like it was for the Sentinels of Light. Hopefully we can actually see the changes made in the lore and not just be told they happened. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. For the sake of the future of the lore, I think making it more accessible should be a priority. Personally, I think revamping the universe website could still be worth Riot's investment. Make it easier to navigate and to find what you want. Merge it with the map and actually update them. Maybe like before, you could reward players for checking the universe website with free icons or other collectibles. Design and program it in such a way that you can have access to it from an app or the League client. A website like this would be an amazing resource to have alongside the MMO. Maybe the map could give you details like quests and NPC locations. Maybe, if an NPC mentions an event that happened in the world, you could go to the map and find a story about said event. Maybe if something in the world changes, you could see those changes on the website slash map. In the League client right now, to learn about a champion's lore, you have to go to your collection, select a champion, select overview, and there you only have a small description. If you want to learn more, you have to click here and then you are redirected to their universe page where you see the same description again as well as links for their bio and stories. By the way, depending on your region, these pages might not even be up to date. If presenting the universe on the client is not feasible, despite it being considered when the universe was first revealed, we can simplify things by including at least the full biography on the client as well as the links for their stories. Having more about the world of Runeterra in the client in any way would be great. A map with regions where players can learn more without being redirected somewhere else. Stories, cinematics, anything. Being able to promote the lore to more League players means these players will be more likely to try other products which use the Runeterra IP. Sure, most of them will probably not stick around for long, but some will. And the same also applies to LOR and Wild Rift. Speaking of which, all three games already have systems designed for storytelling. The visual novel modes for League and Wild Rift, the Guild vs Guild system in Wild Rift, and the campaigns in LOR's Path of Champions. Unlike what we got with Sentinels of Light, these can be used to tell shorter stories that reveal a small part of the world and the characters to players, while incentivizing them to play to unlock more. Are they the best vehicle for storytelling? No. Are they a good starting point for players who barely know the lore and characters? Absolutely. There's not one single perfect solution. Honestly, I had a hard time coming up with this part, because the best solution would be to simply go back in time and convince Riot's higher-ups to respect their writers and their readers. But if you've watched this video so far, let me know down below what you think Riot can do to fix the inconsistencies in the lore and get more people to care about the narrative of Runeterra. Alright, let's wrap this up. As I said, I really wanted to end on a hopeful note. I wrote a lot of this script after the lore update, and it was really negative. But then we got the League Dev update in January, and I was actually getting excited and hopeful again. But then the layoffs happened and, well, I wasn't even motivated to finish this script, let alone make a video with it. I really, really wanted to have hope and be able to say, hey, if you've never dared to experience League's amazing lore in a couple of months when season 2 of Arcane comes out, that might be the best time to do so. But, 
with how things are right now, I would probably wait at least a year or two before investing my time into this world. I never experienced the summoners or the Journal of Justice, and I'm confident that someone who hasn't experienced Runeterra outside of Arcane can still find joy in the amazing lore that we have right now. But investing your time and soul into it, when at any moment it can change drastically, yeah, I don't think that's worth doing. And if you've been following the lore for a while like me, I think it's up to us to raise our voices and fight for what we want. Riot has made a lot of mistakes throughout the years, they let us down again and again, but they have acknowledged that and promise to do better, it's up to us to support them when they do the right thing, criticize them when they don't, and leave the world of Runeterra behind if we're no longer happy with it. I'm sure a couple of you have probably considered it at some point, I certainly did after the Sentinels of Light, and well, I considered leaving again after the layoffs. Despite Riot being an evil, greedy corporation, like all big corporations are, the people working there are generally passionate about video games, about what they do and about this fictional world they created. They would gladly give us what we want if they could, but it's not always up to them. And believe me, they try really hard to give us cool things, but it's not always up to them. Maybe in 10 years from now, we'll be able to look back and realize that, yeah, things were tough, but they got better, and maybe by that time, We'll all be playing the MMO, the fighting game, LOR will still be alive, and maybe League finally got a decent client. But as it stands right now, that future is really hard to imagine. Regardless if it happens or not, the stories that we know and love, the characters, voiceovers, comics, cinematics, everything is archived. Nothing is going away, hopefully. The folks at the League Wiki are doing an amazing job archiving every piece of lore and artwork and crediting every single person that worked on them. Remember, Riot didn't make this amazing world, the people who work or worked at Riot did. In the end, regardless of what happens, we'll still have great memories of the things we got to experience and the community that formed around them. I started this YouTube channel and Twitter account because I really liked the world of Runeterra and its characters, but I had no one in my life to share that passion with. And now I'm so happy to be part of a community of people who love this world as much as I do. Don't worry, I'm not going to say that this is my last video, I just want to thank you guys so much for sticking with me and letting me be part of this community. In the last year or so, I've talked with so many cool people, including rioters, and some of them even followed me. Sunny reacted to some of my videos, which gave me a huge boost, Huma on Twitter sharing my videos also helped a lot, and hell, even Mr. League of Legends lore himself has followed me, chatted with me, and even showed some of my very wrong theories in his own videos. Words can't describe how amazing it has been. Thank you.